So today I'm going to talk to you about buffer overflows. So firstly, I'm going to go over what is the aim of a buffer overflow. So the idea of a buffer overflow is you want to run it, so then you can end up running at a higher privilege level. So by that, what I mean is when you're in a shell, um, often you basically you have access to a few things. So for example, on your own computer, you have access to almost everything because you are rude. Now imagine you're on an adversary's computer and they've only given you access to one program and it does a specific thing. But for example, say in some instances, it lets you read passwords. Then imagine if you could run whatever you wanted in that privilege level. You would then be able to read all of their passwords and get around all their authentication if they had some. So what, um, uh, what buffer overflow often allows us to do is it allows us to run at a higher privilege level by opening a shell inside that program. So the idea is you've got your shell that can run this program. This program has access to everything else, right? Then what we can do is if we open a shell inside this program, we inherit all of the privileges that it has. And this, in effect, allows us to do what we want at the higher privilege level. So that is the aim. Now we're going to go over the stack. So when I'm talking about a buffer overflow in this video, I'm talking about one on the stack. There will be heap overflow videos later on, hopefully. So basically the stack is what we put all of our variables into, all of our local variables into, and also information about the function that we're in. So typically when we go into a function, what we store is we store the return address, which is when this program exits, it knows where to return to in the code. So this is very important. Uh, returns a bit of information on the stack. Um, we don't need to worry about this too much for what we're doing, but there are a few things, for example, the base pointer, and I won't go into any more detail there, but there is typically other stuff as well. So now, oops, what goes in here is any command line arguments and then local variables. So let's say we have a main function where we only declare an array of chars, uh, for simplicity this is, obviously other programs will be more complex, that just gives us an array of characters which is 100 bytes long, or 100 characters long. So that will give us this. So as you can see, if we end up overwriting our 100 byte buffer, we end up overwriting the base pointer and we end up overriding return, or we get the opportunity to. So um, note that in this video, I am specifically going for C, and other languages are slightly different, but they follow basically the same things. So imagine if we had, for example, a stir copy function that copied argv1 into stir, right? Argv1 does not have any limitations on size. So this means, if we ever get this opportunity, we are able to overwrite the buffer and in effect overwrite return, which is exactly what we want to do. So, now we've covered the stack. The next thing that we're going to cover is we're going to cover shellcode. So shellcode is the stuff that we have to execute to actually open up the shell in the higher privilege level. So shellcode is typically um, assembly code and a lot of people recommend writing it yourself at least once to see what it's like, um, but you can get a lot of it online. And I've got another video where I have attached some shellcode to it. Um, and for your first few times, I'd recommend just doing that for ease of access. But what shellcode actually is, is it is just a bunch of operations in assembly which end up opening, uh, typically open up another shell that shellcode can do anything you want it to. It is just code that's written in assembly effectively. So if we are to run the shellcode, um, which I've been describing through this video, it will open a shell. Now, knob sleds. These things are fun. This is what makes what we do actually possible. So in assembly, uh, yeah, in assembly language, there is an operation called a knob, which is short for no operation. The cool thing about this is imagine with our shellcode, 
If we didn't have this and we were to try and return to our shellcode, we would have to get it exactly right. And although this may not seem like such a big thing, um, there are basically it randomizes a little bit depending on your environment and it, it changes. So if we don't have to be as precise, that makes our lives a lot easier. Um, also, it's especially useful with things like ASLR, which I will go over in a future video. So basically, what we can do is with these knobs, we can create what we call a knob sled. Because the idea is, if we return to a knob sled, it doesn't actually matter where we return to in the knob sled, because it's going to go no operation, no operation, no operation. It's going to keep doing that until we get to our precious, our precious shell code where we can't miss any operations, otherwise it won't work. So that is why we use knob sleds. Uh, and to clarify, there is no distinct reason why it is 90. It is just a decision that was made a long time ago. Um, that is the assembly instruction for a knob. Okay. Uh, final thing before we actually go over how to exploit it is endianness. So in a lot of these exploits you may be a little bit confused why if we have an address which is for example o x f f f f f c d0 why it is sometimes well not sometimes it is pretty much always written like this. So as you may have noticed this is backwards. I won't write out the rest. But the reason for this has got to do with the endianness of machines. So I won't go over it. If you're interested, feel free to look it up on Google. But basically, as a slight optimization, a lot of the time machines use um, little endian um, things. So basically, whenever we write an exploit, we always turn around the address, but we take it in bits of two. So for example, our first one here, which is D0, is taken from these last two, then we've got FC. If we were to continue, we'd have dash X, FF, dash X, FF. There we go, so we've got that. So that is a bit on endianness. Now, we get to the fun part. How to actually use all of this knowledge to exploit something. So now, I think you've gotten most of the picture. But basically what we want to do is we want to find this here. We want to find the start address of our buffer, um, in particular str, yeah, our variable str. So in a future video I go over exactly how to do this, but the basic idea is you go into GDB and you find out the address of the stack and then you print out a lot of the same things, typically we just do A because we like things being standard, so we know what to look for. And then we just look for the chunk of A's, and that is where it starts. So we want to find this address here. Inside here is what we is where we put what we call our payload. So our payload is this. It is a knob sled, which is as long as we can make it. So for example, if this is a 10 megabyte buffer, we're gonna put 10 megabytes minus, for example, 50 bytes of shellcode, so the idea is knob sleds can actually be huge and that's all good. So this is going to be as long as it can be. Then we're going to have our little bit of shellcode. And then what we're going to have is we're going to have our return address. Our modified return address. So to make our shellcode, what we do is we find out the size of not only the buffer, but how many bytes we have between the start of our buffer and the return address. So although we've got a 100 byte array of characters, we're probably going to end up having 104, if not a little more, um, bytes of buffer. So we've got 100 here, we've got another four here, sometimes we've got other things. So the way we find this out is we basically keep going up in increments of four bytes, and then we eventually will get it a seg fault returning to OX, 41414141. And the reason it's 41 is that's the ASCII code for capital A. Um, that is, of course, if you keep, in, keep on adding in more A's. So typically we do A's, just because it's a convention. Realistically, put whatever you want. Okay, so we're gonna find um, the size of this, 
for the purpose of this video, I'm just going to assume it's 104 because this is 100 here and this is 4. In reality, it may be, uh, may be a bit different. So this whole bit here is 104. Bytes. Uh, the shortest shell code I've found is 23 bytes. So I'm just going to assume it's that. I'll write that down. Um, it doesn't really matter how long it is as long as it works. Um, and then, because we've got 104 bytes here, whoops, that should be before our return address. So then our return address is four bytes here. Uh, sorry, I should have said earlier, um, it's four bytes because we're working on 32-bit architecture in this example. 64 bits a little bit different, but it's basically doing the same thing, just with slightly different variable sizes. So we've got 104 bytes to play with here. Basically, the knob sled can be 104 minus 23. So we're going to have 81 bytes of knob sled, 23 bytes of shell code, then we're going to have the return address.